Welcome to BizTech Conversations. Good morning, I'm Brian Fernandez and our guest on BizTech Conversations today is Victor Chua. He's the chairman of the Malaysian Venture Capital and Private Equity Association. Welcome to the show, Victor. Thank you, Brian. Thanks for having me here. Now, Victor, walk us through what NVCA does and what has been your achievements in the last two years mm. or in the past two years since that you're now in your third tenure as chairman. Yeah, sure. Um, I think as a very brief introduction to MVCA, uh, well, it's an association that's been around for, for, for more than a decade. Um, what we do is we are the voice that represents the venture capital and private equity industry. Um, all in all, what we help is we talk to the government, we talk to agencies, ministries, in order to help build an ecosystem, an industry environment that is suitable for more players in the market locally, as well as for foreign players to come into the industry as well. And I think um, some of the things that we have done so far ever since I took over as the chairman of MVCA is really to do two things. First of all, to rebrand MVCA to be a much more friendlier and open association where we not just accept Malaysian members, but we also accept international members, VCs and PEs who are from abroad the, 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 the region to come into Malaysia to be a part of the family. Okay, but what is the reason for that? I mean, mm -hmm. um, uh, if I'm a foreign VC, sure. why would I join MVCA? Is that networking? Is it deal flow? What, what's that all about? What's the incentive? Sure. I think in the past, people kind of overlooked Malaysia because you, you have Singapore, which is a very good capital market. At the same time, Indonesia is a huge market that there's a lot of PE funds and VC funds who actually invested into Indonesia just like Vin Capital, the, my, my VC, we invested quite a bit of money into Indonesia as well. But over time, Malaysia has proven to be a resilient enough market for deal flow. At the same time, there's more and more LPs who are interested to look at international opportunities as well. Um, if you look at VC and PE, these are asset classes that used to be very country specific. But given the current climate, given the current industry environment, Southeast Asia is becoming more and more integrated. There's a convergence amongst the economies within Southeast Asia, and that's why Malaysia is in the center of a lot of things because of the fact that Malaysians are very versatile and we are adaptable enough to be able to survive in any kind of environment. So Malaysia is becoming more interesting for international players, and which is why there's a lot more investments coming into Malaysia, and hence, it makes sense for them to be a part of MVCA as well. Give me an example of funds that, uh, foreign funds uh, that have been active in the Malaysian market. KK Fund from Japan, comes to mind as an example. Could yep. you share some more examples? Sure. Um, I think from the local ecosystem um, itself, like we have MathCap as a member um, in MVCA, they have been very crucial in bringing in a lot of the foreign support, foreign investors to come and set up base in Malaysia itself. For example, we have Finance Startups. Uh, um, obviously, we have Kylie who is a Malaysian in Finance Startups. But then again, for Finance Startups to be interested to set up base to invest into Malaysia, to talk to local stakeholders, that's really an achievement. And this was brought in by MathCap, who's our member. On and that's been about six or seven years ago. Yes, already. exactly. They yes. are. They have done a couple of funds already. They have Southeast Asia specific funds as well. And that's been tremendous because of that, Malaysia is getting a lot more limelight because you know, of all places, Final Startup decided to choose Malaysia as the starting point for Southeast Asia. So I suppose mm -hmm. that gave, because of 500 startups and mm -hmm. who they are, that gave Malaysia visibility to the Silicon Valley. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. I mean, in the past, Malaysia used to be one of the top economies in terms of you know, getting into, 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 into tech, getting into manufacturing. And, and we kind of slacked along the way. Um, I, I think it's kind of a, an effect of being complacent. But coming out from what happened in the financial crisis earlier on, I think people are starting to realize that, look, you gotta move on, you gotta innovate, otherwise you're gonna be thrown at the back of the truck and, and nothing's gonna happen. <laughs> um, so, so with that exposure, we open up our Malaysian ecosystem to the Valley ecosystem. At the same time, welcoming in more other funds, like for example, Gobi, which I was a part of, mm -hmm. to sell shop in Malaysia as a HQ as well. That opened up the Chinese ecosystem into Malaysia and, and the fact that even local VC funds are able to fundraise from foreign LPs, that shows that I think the Malaysian crowd is actually getting much more attention right now. And what is your direction uh, in your third tenure as MVCA yeah. uh, uh, chairman? Yeah. Um, what are the key objectives they're looking for to achieve? Sure. Um, rebranding, restructuring, re, uh, I think re-strategizing and repositioning MVCA has always been my key focus. Okay. And I don't think of it as an overnight job because it's not easy to build a brand. It's not easy to build content. 
which I, which I believe you totally get it given that you're coming from a media uh, background. So for me, as this is like my third tenure, the moving forward goal is to really see how we can create more IP, intellectual property or knowledge capital that can be of use for members and for the ecosystem. One of the other thing that, that we have done so far is to create a periodical session workshops where we actually encourage or we actually got VCs, lawyers, tech agents, whoever it is, to come in to provide content or knowledge to our members as well as people who are interested in the VC and PE industry. So what it means is that we could be doing workshops, we could be doing training or panel sessions in order to help enhance the knowledge base of our local Malaysian um, entrepreneurs and, and investors as well. So that's the other part where um, it was not done in, in the earlier days. Yes, we did our annual workshops to, to provide hands-on training to all the members, but that is not enough. We need to empower the entrepreneurs as well because without the deal flow, without good quality deal flow, who is able to talk to investors effectively, investors are gonna find it hard to find good deals to invest into. And it's a vicious cycle. You don't have deals, you can't invest, then you can't have LPs. So we need to create a market where everyone is knowledgeable enough to talk the same lingo. And I'm gonna come back to that later in the interview mm -hmm. and, and we'll talk about the, the various stakeholders like Magic mm -hmm. and uh, uh, also MDEC and how they play a role, the government plays a, a very key role in the ecosystem. Yep. But before that, could you just give us an overview of the funding landscape today? Sure. Uh, because obviously in the last 24 months, mm -hmm. we've had uh, several iterations and uh, uh, drastic seismic shifts yep. in terms of how the ecosystem has evolved. Yep, yep, yep. Um, like it or not, Malaysia is a part of the global landscape. Um, as much as we would like to think that Malaysia is independent enough to, to survive and, and grow on our own, um, that's not the truth. We, I think, I think we, we, we had a brief experience of what happened during the WeWork period, the, the boom and crash of WeWork. Well, I don't think it's a crash. They're still going around. It's just that there was a huge change at WeWork. And then we have the pre-COVID, then we have the current, current COVID environment. So in the last 24 months, what has really changed is the mindset of investors, the mindset of LPs, the mindset of traditional investors as well. Okay, and, so let's, yeah. talk, let's walk that through and then let's drill down a little sure. bit closer. If we look at pre-WeWork, obviously valuations were yeah. very uh, uh, stretched. Yes. Um, and then uh, with the WeWork valuation crash, the failed IPO, yeah. you had a sobering of the market mm -hmm. and everyone started to look more at profitability. Yeah. How, what was that impact in Malaysia? Mm -hmm. um, I think... Similar to a lot of the other markets, before the crash or collapse of the WeWork um, era, the biggest thing, metrics that everyone was chasing after was valuation. And that comes at a price of sometimes really neglecting the fundamentals of the investees. Meaning, you know, you want companies who are able to fundraise multiple rounds, but you kind of put less weightage on the ability of the founders in running the business. So that was, I think, uh, 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 I would say, I wouldn't say a mistake, but that was the trend that everyone was going after pre. Yeah, because it was a growth at all cost kind exactly. of model, right? Exactly, exactly. You know, the money was was being thrown at startups uh, um, because of the fact that if you are a high profile startup, it's much easier for you to raise money. So everyone wants to be as high profile as possible. They want to be the next rework. They want to be the next Airbnb, etc., etc. So that that was really the mindset. But right after um, you talk about sobering. I think that that was a good lesson for every investors because if pre pre, pre work it was about valuation it was about spray and pray you are kind of trying to invest into everything to make sure to hope that one of them can be the next big thing but post we work it was really about zooming into what you mentioned profitability but i guess profitability is a very controversial term because as a startup if you're always profitable yes it could be good but then again you are actually sacrificing your growth as well so what investors were looking for after that, obviously profitability is one of the things, but it's more about sustainability. To me, when an investment happens, it has to be a sustainable investment because all of the funds have a fund life. If your startup can't, can't last you know, during the duration of your fund, it means that you're gonna have a write-off. It means that you're gonna lose money. So for companies, for investors who are looking at companies, 
we were looking at sustainability of the investments. Um, so I think that, that's, that's pretty much the keyword to summarize yeah. what happened after we work. And then now, mm -hmm. with the COVID crisis, yeah. post-COVID, yeah. funding winter has set in perhaps? I don't think it's, it's a winter as per se. Um, people are definitely more worried about cash. They, um, they, 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 they want to you know, hoard cash. But it was just, I believe it's just a time for, for family officers, for investors to re-strategize because this is a shock to the market. It's a black swan event. No one expected COVID-19 to happen. No one expected all this pandemic to happen because you know, no one wants that to happen. So since January this year and until now, I believe like, investors would have been trying to re-strategize because you, 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 you need to think about how to spend and invest your money. Once that process is done, the money is going to come back again because it doesn't make sense for you to keep your money in a bank account, especially like in Malaysia, our FD rate is so low. So it doesn't make sense for investors to put money in the bank, in FD, and they need to find another area of investment so that we can actually you know, survive and, and, and last legacy. But Victor isn't, so let's go back historically and, mm. and we'll go back to the 2000 dot com crash. Sure. We will also go back to 2008. How the VC funds then basically reacted mm -hmm. was to hunker down Yep. shut down unprofitable businesses that required a long runway yep. to profitability. Then what they did was they doubled down or nursed some of those companies that they had in their portfolio mm -hmm. to ensure they had sufficient runway to be successful when times have turned. Yep. Is that what you're seeing today? Yes. Um, as, as soon as pandemic happened, most of, actually all of the VCs were doing the same thing. VCs, PE, they were going back to their companies. If they're on the board, they're going to be more hands-on. Try to make sure that um, their portfolio companies would have enough runway, at least to last for the next 9 to 12 months. That's a very natural and prudent way of managing the portfolio. But if you zoom into P VC funds especially, you will notice that actually not many of them has been really affected by the pandemic. Okay, because they, the they've done fundraising much earlier, they, yes. they've got uh, dry powder that they're yes. holding on to. Yes, but that's just one of the reasons. Okay. The other reason is because of the fact that VCs have been focusing a lot on digital um, companies as well as tech companies, these are guys that are currently on demand. You're starting to see Petronas using more and more startups. You're starting to see a lot of more traditional businesses trying to integrate and work with, um, of, with tech companies because they know that the only way to go is to go digital, is to go tech. And if you can't reach out to your audiences physically, the best way is to go online. And, and, and I think that is also one of the reasons why most of the VCs in town are still, you know, we are, I would say we, we, we are totally you know, uh, uh, um, complacent about things. But compared to the dot-com boom, the bust and everything, right now it seems like a better timing for VCs because the pandemic reminds everyone that if you're not innovating, you're, you're destined to do. So with that, yeah, VCs are doing what they, we can, but at the same time, we are actually enjoying the fruits of investing into the tech companies. Yeah, and of course at lower valuations as well. Exactly, exactly. This now, is the best time to shop. Yeah, so <laughs> the thing is, coming back to that, if we look at the whole funding uh, 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 stages, mm -hmm. Malaysia, one of the key challenges has been, we've seemed to have enough money at pre-seed, seed, and series A, mm -hmm. but series B and C, Many Malaysian startups basically had to go to Singapore or other markets, get money from overseas. Yep. What scenario do you see panning out over the next 12 to 24 months? Is there enough money at that early stages to fund, be it angel deals, be it Cradle, be it MDAC? Yep. Is there enough to, to, to fund the next lot of innovative companies? Mm. Or have the angel investors all said, okay, we're going to sit down and wait for a while? <laughs> Yeah, I think that's a very good question because funding gap has always been a topic that governments, ecosystems, industries have been talking about. Yes, at one point there was an argument that there's not enough Series B and C funds going out. Uh, and, and, and that is, you know, that was the topic back then. But now there's more and more growth stage funds, the Bs and Cs and Ds funds out there because even the PE funds are coming up with their own growth funds as well. You have the likes of TPG, they have, they have the team in Singapore looking at deals as well. Uh, we have been in contact with them for multiple times because of the fact that they are looking for early stage deals. And, 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 and if you zoom down to early stage, you're talking about the C, Series A, even pre seed as well. I do believe that there's, there's a need for more funding because I generally rank countries by the stage of the majority of the startups. 
in Malaysia, we are still pretty much a seed and Series A country because there's just not that many Series B companies out there that are looking for funding. The, the bigger ones, you could be talking about, you know, um, 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 Fave or Carson, which we invested. But beyond those guys, a select group of, of companies out there, there's pretty much not enough Series B companies because there is also not enough early stage funding to actually support all these companies to hit that stage. It's almost like, you know, it's you need to have the whole value chain. If there's not enough early stage fundings, you won't have enough deal flow. Yeah, and you won't have deal, exactly, because yes. it's, it's, uh, it, it's domino a stage. effect. Domino yeah. effect. Yes, yes, yes. So, so I think we need to pay more attention to early stage funding because these are going to be the funnel for the growth funds that has already raised funding. If you talk about growth funds, there's multiples looking at Malaysia as well. Gobi has a growth fund. They're looking for deal flow as well. But at the same time, there's a lot of opportunity to invest at early stage because this is the best time to start a startup, okay. to start a company to actually work with the traditional businesses. Back then, it will be very difficult for you to get a contract with UAM, for example. But now, it's going to be much easier to work with all those traditional guys because they know that they don't know much about tech. And in order for them to actually innovate, to actually spin out um, a new solution, they need to work with the entrepreneurs to know um, what they're doing. Okay, let's... We, we talk broadly about ecosystem. Let's talk yep. about specific deals. Yep. Now, in the last 24 months, what sort of exits have, have mm. uh, uh, happened in the Malaysian ecosystem that you would say were success stories? Yeah, um, I, I think one of the deals that exists that was closest to heart is, is one of the investments that I made when I was in Gobi um, called Hermo. Simple. You are an e-commerce for cosmetic products. You know, if you, if you want your face mask, if you want your, your, your cosmetic products from Korea, from Japan, you just go and buy. Um, invested in them about three years or four years ago and exited before I left Gobi. That was a fantastic deal because it was a, of a good return. How, what, what, how many X did you get? Um, in terms of IRR, I think it was about 91%. Uh, wow, fantastic. Um, so it was fantastic because it was a strategic buyout from a Japanese company. Okay, um, which one was that? Um, um, they're called iStyle. Um, okay. They own Ed Cosme, Elias mm -hmm. Cosme. So they themselves are a startup from Japan. They are a large company. They have launched their own products as well. They have their own retail outlets as well. For them, they are interested to look at Southeast Asia as a market, which is why they look at Malaysia as one of the more mature countries. And Hermo is and was the top dog in, in, in Malaysia as well. Um, the top uh, pro e commerce platform that was that was about e co or cosmetics. So, for them, naturally, they want to acquire the biggest boy in town because, as a Japanese company, they find it difficult to expand into Southeast Asia because of the culture, the cultural differences. Japanese are typically much not, not as versatile as, as Malaysians. Hence, for them, it's much easier for them to grow inorganically by buying up someone. So, that was, I think, one of the success stories that Malaysia deserves because we have so many talents over here, but a lot of them, a lot of times, you're not being captured by the Malaysian news because a lot of them has moved out or beyond Malaysia. Yeah. So let's talk about two deals, two other deals that that I, I would say the, the, the report card is a little bit mixed. Yeah. yeah. Uh, one is iFlix, mm -hmm. obviously. So iFlix uh, was purchased mm -hmm. by Tencent. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but that was, I think, a very strategic deal. Same reasons probably as what you mentioned with the Japanese. They yep. wanted to get a footprint in Southeast Asia and, yep. and stuff like that. But for iFlix itself, it was more of a distressed uh, exit. Uh, what are your thoughts on that deal? Um, disclaimer, obviously we don't know enough about the details of, of the transactions, but I think um, it's a smart move by iFlix because they are in competition with Netflix and HBO is coming up with their own solution as well. Uh, 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 um, obviously Disney has Disney Plus. So it's a battle of content. It's a battle of who owns more IPs, who owns more titles and with that iFlix seems to be the, 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 the weakest of, of them all because Disney and HBO and even Netflix right now, both, all of them produce their own content. And I would think that they would never want to put it on iFlix because of the fact that, you know. It's a competitor. It's yeah, a competitor. Of course. So in, in a case, it's a smart move to actually partner up with Tencent because Tencent, obviously they're huge. Yeah. And Tencent doesn't really have that kind of business yet in this part of the world. So it's a natural progression for them to actually work with, 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 with Tencent. However, having said that, I think the it's, it's really more of a market factor why iFlix wouldn't be able to do as well as the counterparts. Yeah. Also because of the fact that there's not enough good strategic funding 
who's able to support iFlix. Yeah, and that's a wrong, long runway that's required and you've got Tencent. So Tencent yes. got a very good deal and then iFlix, instead of closing, obviously was able to exit yes, out. Exactly, yeah. exactly. I mean, it's, it's better to, to be able to, to you know, exit than to shut it out entirely. Correct. And I think that brings me to the next deal, which was just uh, broken on mm -hmm. DNA yesterday, yep, uh, yep. which is basically the iMoney mm -hmm. Juristech deal. Yep, yep. Um, iMoney was obviously one of the darlings of yeah. the Malaysian tech scene yep. a couple of years ago, and it was acquired by iSelect from yes. Australia. Yep. And um, obviously, iSelect uh, decided that it was not strategic to them, they were mm -hmm. not going to fund it anymore. Yeah. But and, and then Juris Tech has taken over. But yeah. what I thought was very fascinating was in terms of investor behavior, they were very founder friendly. Mm -hmm. So they sold it back to the founder at uh, Ching at a very uh, nominal fee. Mm -hmm. uh, also wrote off some loans as yeah. well to yeah. the founder, yeah. uh, from what I understand. Um, I, I wanted to bring that up because that's really an example of uh, a wonderful example of how a VC or investor is very founder friendly. Uh, yeah. Your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think it's a very good gesture by Iceland because at the end of the day, give and take. If you are going to be harsh to the founders, and, who, uh, and, 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 and that means that you're going to get the same treatment from the founders as well. Um, and as, an, as a company, as an investment firm, you're going to be there for long. And if you want to have a good network of partners who is willing to work with you over the long term, you need to be able to, to be fair and, and, and to be friendly. Because if you are being harsh to, on, on this particular case, it, it shows that you are also going to be like that in other yes, situations. Of course. Yes, so of course. it's a repetition, rep, your, your reputation at stake. For any investors, for any large companies, Repetition is much more valuable than just one deal itself. So it's a very good gesture by Iceland. I think that's a very mature and, and, and respectable um, decision to, you know, to, to, to have that deal with, with Ching or, or with iMoney. And, and, and I think more investors should be like that because you want to avoid having the ego. You want to avoid having that, 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 that su superiority complex to think that just because you own majority of the company, you are the boss. And, and that's something that investors are starting to change as well. In the past, investors look at look at ourselves as you, you know we are the, the bigger boys. We the entrepreneurs should listen to us. But in actuality, in reality, we don't know what we don't know, and we definitely are not supposed to be as experienced or as knowledgeable as the founders. Otherwise, why would we want to invest into the founder? Yeah, absolutely. If we think that we know more than them, then might as well we just go and start the business and, 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 and be their competitor. We shouldn't have been investing. Uh, unless you're investing in it just to sniff and, and, and hijack stuff. Yeah. Otherwise, you know, you're supposed to be supporting the team no matter what. Because if they win, you win. There's an analogy that I like to use. As an investor, as a, a shareholder, if you're not the founder, you should be Robin and let mm -hmm. your founders be the Batman. You don't have to be Batman yeah. all the time. Yeah. Yeah. You, you know, what's the point of being Batman all the time when, when there's more people who can fight crime than just you yourself? Now, Victor, I'm going to ask you, sure. in terms of investment themes moving forward, yeah. um, where, what, what are your members talking to you about? I mean, from, and, and we can look at it from two aspects. Obviously, financially, it's going to be about path to profitability. Yep, yep. But from a technology standpoint and sector investment, mm -hmm. what are people looking at now post-COVID? Sure. I think one of the highlight right now is on how do we help the SMEs. Like it or not, SMEs are the bigger, biggest crowd in any countries. Malaysia, Indonesia especially, Thailand as well. Wherever, wherever you are, SMEs are the biggest crowd. The most fragile part of the economies are always SMEs as well. So at this point of time, there's a lot of you know, discussions around how do we invest in the solutions that will help SMEs to go online, as simple as that. Even, even that, that's a huge opportunity to help them to go online, to help them to go uh, reach out to their audiences online, and eventually help them to understand how to improve their business through all these BI platforms or and analytics that they have. So that is one of the areas that, 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 that I believe has a lot of opportunity. The other area of opportunity is really to, to go one step further, to encourage more younger brands, for example, um, 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 we call this D2C, direct to consumers. Mm -hmm. Instead of you know, usually going through the retailers um, to sell your products, now younger brands has an opportunity to sell directly to you and me. Yes. Because digital enables everything. The world no longer has sufficient privacy. 
So yes. everyone can be, it's, it's reachable, just one click away. So that is also another area which I believe there's a lot of potential. But of course, last but not least, um, I think overall, cross-border or related um, um, startups would be very, very lucrative as well. Okay. When I talk about cross-border, it means if you're a tech company or a tech startup who's actually enabling products or services to be brought from one market to another market, that will be perfect. Okay. Because at this point of time, you can't move around. You can't cross the border. You, you, the borders are all closed. So it's a logistics, logistics space. supply chain. I mean, yeah. in general supply chain, um, which is why we, we invested quite a bit of supply chain distribution um, services. Um, because that's where, that's how actually you make any economy run. If there's any economy that's not functioning well, chances are it's because of the supply chain that's not uh, perfect enough. Now the government has, well, let's move on to the government and its role in the ecosystem. Yep. Malaysia, we are quite blessed. The government has spent a lot of money. Yep. Um, the, uh, basically, the, the key stakeholders are the likes of Magic, mm -hmm. MDAC, uh, of course, Cradle uh, really uh, has been pivotal in that, that yep. successfully building up the ecosystem. We've got a, a good angel network by M M Ben, yeah. um, and also the Securities Commission. Mm -hmm. Now, in terms of the, the, the legislative processes, having ECF and ECF and P2P funding taking off in a very big way in Malaysia. Yeah. What's MVCA's view on the government's role moving forward? What could they do more? Sure. What have they done right? What have they done wrong? Sure. I think the government has done very well in terms of catalyzing the market. Like, like what you mentioned about ECFs, P2Ps, fantastic because it opens up the market to a lot more players and at the same time when you do that more people will have hands-on experience it means that there will be knowledge that will be accumulated and that can be passed on when there's more and more participants so that that's been done very well and i think that should be done even more in the future because if government stops catalyzing the market it means that the private sectors would, would you know think twice should i be the scapegoat should i be the guinea pig who experiment new products or, 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 or that, that's not been proven or not done by the government yet. So the government should do more of that. Um, however, I think one, one of the downside, or I guess one of the things that the government hasn't really been doing or, or done well enough is to empower the local VC um, players, for example. Say, why, why, say, why do I say that? Because it's kind of like in our DNA that, 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 that we always think that foreign brands are better. And what that means is that a lot of institutional funds, for example, they would prefer to invest into overseas VCs or overseas PE funds. They don't really have much of a focus for local VC or PE funds because it's always a, like a, a stereotype that foreigners are much better than the local guys. But what we are trying to prove from MVCS um, base, and at least, from, at least from, from my own firm as well, is to show that even local players could do the, as, as good as a job as the foreigners who are actually coming into the Malaysian ecosystem. And I think that's the part where the government has overlooked. There's too much attention of bringing more foreign brands into the country, but there's not enough attention in building up local VCs who has been doing a great job in the past, which means local VCs tend to have smaller funds. Local VCs tend to have smaller outfit because of the fact that they don't get the local support. Imagine a Malaysian VC going out to the US to raise funds and, and, and the US guys will look at the current existing investors that the VC has and if there's no funds from Malaysia, I don't think the VCs, the, the LPs from, from the US would want to invest into that fund. So, in, so I think that, that, I hope you get what I mean. Yes. Local government should support the local VCs even more. No, and also it's about uh, 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 risk diversification because yep. essentially now for most Malaysian VCs, it's single country risk. Yep. Everything yep. is invested yep. in Malaysia itself. So there's no, not only a sector, no sectorial, there could be sectorial diversification locally, yep. but there's no geographical uh, diversification. So that's a very, very risky proposition. But most of the VCs in Malaysia have already diversified, unless you're talking about specific funds that are done up by, by, by government, by, by corporates. But like, for example, for, for, for us, we invest Southeast Asia. So that's your VIN capital, your yes. personal company. Yes, yeah. not just us. Like if you talk about, uh, f um, for example, RHL, the local family office, yeah, they do regional deals as well. Um, if you talk about T capital or interest, they are Malaysian, but that's mainly because of the mandate 
that they were being restricted by their LPs. But otherwise, there's a lot of VCs in Malaysia who are actually investing regionally as well. Actually, and we, let's let's pivot to the the PE space yep, where sure. that happens a lot more, and, and your members uh, are, are in in that space as mm -hmm. well. Um, and, and an example that brings to uh, comes to mind is basically Cradle Capital, yes. which from Fund One yep. has invested basically in three markets. It was Malaysia, Indonesia, mm -hmm. and India. India. Yes, yes, yes. You know, what are your your members in the PE space? Uh, currently looking at what's what sort of opportunities do they see in the next 24 months sure i think a lot of them are still trying to hunker down on you know, focusing on the malaysian market because malaysia probably has one of the more mature on, on pe environment compared to indonesia compared to vietnam so there's a lot of good pe funds that's why there's, that's why there's a lot of good pe funds who are based out of malaysia as well you have the likes of cradle of course you also have nevis as much as you know the top guys are foreigners but they have been in Malaysia for and the they've last, been the long donkey's years. Exactly, yes. exactly. And, and they've and been, been known very long. successful. Exactly, exactly. They've done their QSR, they've done a lot of good deals as well. So so for 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 with that it shows that Malaysia is definitely a very lucrative PE market. And that's why you see a lot of PE funds who wants to focus on the Malaysian ecosystem because it's more mature. Legislatively speaking, um, the law here is able to protect the investors. Compared to if you go into Indonesia, there's going to be a lot more um, nuances that you have to deal with. Hence, it makes it easier for PE guys to focus on Malaysia. But I guess um, Brahma Credo is, is a very different um, kind of PE fund. And plus, or because of his experience, he's able to get Indonesian and India deal as well. So it's really up to the partners, the GPs, who, um, depending on what strength they have. And that's why they want to have that kind of exposure. Now, Victor, your personal company is Vin Capital. Yep. Uh, you've invested in Kasem. Yep. Um, what was the reason behind that and, and how's that investment doing? Um, in short, they're doing very well. Um, they are one of the, actually they're the company that we worry the least because they are the most mature one amongst the portfolio companies that we have. Um, I actually invested in Kasem when I was in Gobi, uh, my previous employment, mm -hmm. uh, and, 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 and I was on the board as well. So I know the company pretty well. Then when I left um, Gobi to start Vin Capital, um, it was a no-brainer because I know how well Carson was growing and they have the right product market fit where it could be scaled across the region and truth to be told, they're now in four countries, Malaysia, Thailand, Singapore and Indonesia and all of their country exposure has been growing tremendously as well. Even uh, during the COVID period? Of course, because at the end of the day, um, um, Carsum is in online to offline in a yeah. way because they have the physical outfit to help um, to, 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 to certify your cars, to, to actually help uh, inspect your cars. So, so obviously during the, the COVID, the, the lockdowns, it was bad, but it only took them two months after MCO in the foreign company in Malaysia, two months after that to have close to 100% recovery. And, and and obviously I'm not too sure whether this is this is, can be go can go public, but July was the best month ever for the company since the inception. So okay, so, and what was the driver for that? Um, I mean, there, there's probably a few few explanation around that. So, um, one of the the most obvious one is that people are avoiding public transportation because they're wary about social distancing. They're worried about you know being in the public. So there's more and more demand for used cars and because cars is really all about used cars that's why you know people are buying more used cars uh, especially those who can't afford new cars they want to get the used car from 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 Carson. so that's where we see a lot more transactions happening and that's why it helped boasted um, um boast, boasted the growth for Carson and the recovery of Carson as well and and because of all the data that we've seen that's why Carson launched their new product line as well in the past as a consumer, as a used car owner, I'm just selling it to true Carsum. Carsum will pass the vehicles on to the dealers. But now, by partnering with the dealers, we are actually doing e-commerce for cars as well. What it means is that instead of just selling my cars, I could also buy a used car from Carsum, and Carsum will deliver it to my doorstep. So that's something that we just So is this a today. virtual inventory model or have you got a virtual inventory or do you physically own the asset? We work with the dealers. I mean, okay. there's, 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 I, mean I, I think it's, it's best to talk to a customer about this, but we work with the dealers to, to help uh, okay. bring the cars across as well. But it's an end-to-end -end experience. Well, not entirely end-to-end -end yet, but right now it's a very complete experience where besides just selling your car, you'll get a replacement almost immediately.
<laughs> so it's a value chain that we are enhancing and that's why you know it was a no-brainer for, for, for us to invest especially when between um, myself and Eric um, the founder we have worked together for a long time and I respect and I believe in his vision of forecasting so so again going back to the I select um, my money situation it is really about how you support your CEOs your founders and this is what <clears throat> we do to support them as well Victor, final words is uh, the, uh, your thoughts as chairman of uh, MVCA. Yeah, um, I, I hope the Malaysian ecosystem can grow even larger because if you compare us to Singapore, we are six times bigger in terms of population, but they have V5 or six times or even more uh, than that uh, in terms of number of VCs, number of PEs um, operating in Singapore relative to Malaysia. So my hope going forward, and we will do so from MVCA as well, is to create more platforms for VCs, for new, for new VCs, for new professionals who want to come out to launch their fund, whether they want to invest into early stage, growth stage, or P stage, to actually set up their base in Malaysia. And and I think as much as, as we, we like what we're seeing from what the government is doing, we believe there's more that needs to be done in order to grow the local guys. Hence, you know, we are always open for collaboration. And I think um, collaboration is probably the keyword for success um, moving forward. So that's from me. Victor, it's been a pleasure having you on BizTech Conversations. We've been speaking to Victor Chua, Chairman of the Malaysian Venture Capital and Private Equity Association. I'm Brian Fernandez on BizTech Conversations. Please check us out on www.biztech.asia to have more business and technology conversations.